Hey there, uh, this is Andrea Balboni, Sex, Love, and Relationships Coach, and I'm here today with Nikki Hodgson. Hi. Hey, Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> <laughs> and Nikki is a freelance journalist. She's fantastic and amazing. If you haven't read her work, she writes on sex and relationships. She's also been a dominatrix, and she is um, has worked for the dating industry as well. So some of the people that she writes for, some of the publications she writes for, are The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times. She also broadcasts with the BBC, BBC Three, and um, Sky News. She's also on BBC Radio and has written a few books, which I will uh, put in the comments so you can check them out. They're fantastic. And also has done some documentaries. She's done loads, basically. <laughs> she is a pro. And I am so pleased to have her here today to talk about uh, sex, love, and relationships with us. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. <laughs> so um, recently here in the UK, there has been some debate on the fact that we Britons, well, I'm American, but I've been li living here long enough, so I hope I can be honorary. <laughs> I'm honorary, thank you, have been having less sex than in the past 10 years. So my question to Nikki is, is this decrease in quantity uh, something that we should worry about, or is it actually okay? Yeah, really good question. I think that we're actually on the threshold of a new sexual revolution. Mm. It's not as explosive and as exciting as it might have been in the 1960s, when everything just kind of liberalised overnight and people stopped worrying so much about the class structures, certainly in Britain, um, the class structures that were pre uh, preventing them from having relationships with anybody they wanted. Mm. Um, you know, it's, all of a sudden find to have a mixed race relationship, uh, all these kinds of things that happened quite quickly in the 60s. But I think what is happening is there's a sense that the attitude to sex that has been serving us isn't serving us any longer. And by that, I mean the idea that you should always be ready for it, that it's kind of the uh, most important factor in the relationship, mm -hmm. that if you're not having very much, that's a sign that your relationship's in trouble. Um, that you know, a healthy person is a person with loads of desire all the time, who always wants to get on it. And also the kind of monogamy issue and the standard relationship issue that you should be in a heterosexual coupling mm. and you should really be monogamous. And if you are not those things, then maybe you're a freak or you're, you're kind of an outlier. Mm. And I think people are accepting that those things are not true by and large for most people. Okay. So do you feel that that's affecting the amount that we have sex then? Yeah, I think it is because I think people just can't live up to this false set standard anymore. Mm. And the idea that, you know, I think everybody's read those sex surveys in, you know, women's or men's magazines that say, you know, the average amount of sex a week is this. And, mm -hmm. and the instinct is to think, well, I'm yes. not doing the average and that's wrong or I'm doing over the average, so what's wrong with us equally? Yeah. Um, and I think a stepping away from that sense of average is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Because the reason this has become a topic of discussion is because... Um, Academics have been studying what they call the NATSAR, which is the National um, Survey of Attitudes to Sex mm -hmm. and Relationships. And it's studied in 10 year periods. Um, so you get sort of three readings. There's quite a lot of data now. Mm -hmm. We've had NATSAR one, two, and three. Okay. And so basically, it's looking back at a period and seeing how people's relationships have improved or mm -hmm. depreciated in quality over that period. Mm -hmm. And what has become common is this idea of them having less sex over the time. But that's in correlation with things like um, the rise and democratisation of porn, okay. um, the Fifty Shades effect. Mm -hmm. um, women having more power to say no, mm -hmm. legally and socially. Mm -hmm. And the greater tolerance of LGBTQI people. Mm. So all these factors are affecting who we are picking, on what terms we're picking them, and what kind of sex we want to have. Mm. So it's not as simple as just saying, oh, all those heterosexual people that were doing it three times a week are now only doing it two times a week. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Like, yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. So there's a wider swath of people that we're speaking to in, in different ways. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And people just being much more free to be honest about the sex they are actually having and the sex mm -hmm. they would want to have and with whom. Mm. So that has been the big difference in the past sort of 30 years. It's a big shift in time. Okay, amazing. Can you please explain a little bit more about the Fifty Shades effect? Yeah, so the Fifty Shades effect is this idea that when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, there was this community of people in the BDSM world that finally stepped into the light. Mm -hmm. And not because they'd been hiding, but because mainstream society hadn't really been looking for them or mm -hmm. looking at them. Okay. And 
there was a greater acceptance that maybe some of those activities that had been in the past criminalised and also really misunderstood were actually probably just lots of fun. Mm, okay. And so lots of people wanted to try them out. Mm-hmm. And that was reflected in the sales of BDSM products mm-hmm. and toys okay. and the books, obviously, and then other manuals. Mm-hmm. And um, even the rise in BDSM porn, who was clicking on that, who was viewing it, who was buying it. Okay. So there's that. That is actually quite an important phenomenon. And the other knock-on effect of that was that um, there was a great boom in erotica. Mm -hmm. And so not just strictly BDSM stuff, but all kinds of material that mainly aimed at women and Mm -hmm. written by women. So even if you were not into Fifty Shades of Grey, you thought the story was really silly Mm -hmm. and um, the sex scene was not sexy, I think it's had a really positive effect for people because... Again, it's this loosening up of a conversation that for years has been really um, overwrought and people have been worried about it. Mm-hmm. And also, again, all this new content flooding the marketplace, basically, that we can now access. And, and they're just a kind of friendlier face to BDSM, basically. Mm, okay. Yeah. So would you say that's probably improved the quality of the sex that people are having then? I think it's done a few things. I think it's broadened out what people dare ask for. Mm-hmm. I think it's improved the quality because it's so much about consent mm-hmm. and where your boundaries okay. are. Mm-hmm. And if you pay attention to, you know, good BDSM training, whether that's through what you're reading or through somebody else that's mm-hmm. teaching you, you will have better sex for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, just, again, the idea about all this new kind of content and people just being a bit more willing to experiment without fear of judgment, mm-hmm. that could only be a a beneficial thing mm, absolutely yeah wow okay and my other question is with um a woman's right to say no that sounds related to boundaries as well so yeah could you describe a little bit more about that yeah so definitely i mean when you look at the nat that that goes back 30 years so in that time we've had just about you know the criminalization of rape within marriage mm-hmm. and then we've had the me too movement more recently so they're two really important social things that have happened around women completely accepting that they get to decide where the line is Mm. and that there isn't this one act in the sexual repertoire that is the um you know the indicator of sex has happened Mm -hmm. which for most people traditionally has always been penetration Mm -hmm. but if somebody touches you in a way that you haven't invited or um, said is okay or just you go past the point at which you are comfortable you are completely within your rights to say, hey, we've gone over my line. Mm. And so that is a really vital conversation that we've started to have. And equally for men, it applies to, and people of all genders actually, you know, the knock-on effect has been that historically, obviously, women tend to have had their boundaries pushed Mm -hmm. more greatly. I think Mm. it's fair to argue. But I think now we're at a point where men themselves are recognising that maybe they do things or they're complicit in things that are actually not good for them Mm -hmm. and that they, they don't enjoy. Yeah. Because, again, there's this expectation that men are the drivers of sexuality. Mm-hmm. And that's just not true for many people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as far as it affecting how much sex we have, those all of those factors, mm-hmm. is it right or, I don't know if right's the word, is it a correct, I don't know if that's the right word, assumption that now that there are these all of these things, new things that we're considering, that we have more of an imperative to say no, and so we are more, and that the um, the quality or the, the way that we have sex is changing as well. It's... Yeah, I mean, it's a combination. I definitely think the being able to say no has, has been massively beneficial to lots mm-hmm. of people. Mm-hmm. I think what hasn't quite happened yet is to know how to ask for what you would prefer. Mm-hmm. And that's why we're sitting in this space where it looks like all the sex has disappeared. But that's not true. Okay. <laughs> and right. I'm very hopeful that uh, people will start to have bit more Mm -hmm. as they get more confident in asking for what they truly want Mm -hmm. and I think we're just on the peripheries of that socially of knowing what questions to ask to get the pleasure that we want right so I think that's really important um but I also think you know the natural defines things in a very strict way you know Mm -hmm. penetrative sex or oral sex that's basically the definition that's it Mm -hmm. now we all know that we all do all kinds of other sexual things that we definitely consider sex Mm -hmm. they just don't rate in the survey Mm -hmm. so I think what also has happened is that probably the variety of what people are doing is greater now. Okay. So again, I don't necessarily think it's that the number has gone down of the numbers of sexual encounters we're having. If mm-hmm. they measured that, then that would be a 
bit of a different figure to consider. Right. Um, and I, also, sex with yourself is still sex. I mm-hmm. don't see why that's not being counted, really. Right. So, I, yeah. I wanted yeah. to ask about that. Does solo sex count? Or does yeah. self-pleasure count? Well, in the, in the survey, they do register masturbation, like solo mm-hmm. sex. But I don't think they count it in terms of how much sex we're having. Okay. So, yeah. Right. And is there ever a right amount of sex or a wrong amount or too much or too little? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question, too. Um, it's the amount you're comfortable with. It sounds really wishy-washy to say that, and um, it might not be very helpful for some people, but if you go past a point of sex where you think, that's probably enough for this week, mm-hmm. <laughs> or enough for this night, yeah. then you've reached you've reached a limit, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's completely fine to stop. Yeah. And that might just be 10 minutes of touching, mm-hmm. or it might be 10 hours. <laughs> I mean... Right. It, it's going to vary massively on the person, on so mm-hmm. many factors. But the most important thing is to be listening to yourself, to your body, to your kind of uh, your mind, your connection that you have between the two, and thinking, mm, maybe I'm not enjoying this quite as much anymore, and it might be a, a good time to stop. Mm, okay. So mm. self. Um, so just asking yourself what. Feels it's right. definitely about that. I think mm. our the way we live in the twenty first century, everything. The way that kind of capitalism functions might sound quite political, but like the way the working situation is is devised for most people. Obviously, things are changing and getting a bit more kind of mixed up now, but that very strict way of kind of treating your body as a bit of a robot, as a bit of an automaton, and your brain, and that they go to work and they sit in this chair and they do all this stuff like in a very kind of frigid, productive way all day, and then mm-hmm. they knock off at a certain point and then they, you know, they consume in a certain way and they come home. It's, that all dislocates us from the comfort in our bodies and our minds. Mm-hmm. And so I think for most people, because we've had to kind of just swallow our own discomfort so much of the time in a functional way during the day-to-day, that gets carried over into our personal lives. Mm-hmm. And so it's completely understandable that if you had to sit in a chair that was pretty uncomfortable and you just had to get on with it so that you get paid, when you come home and somebody wants to be intimate with you and you're not really feeling it, you might go along with it anyway because that's kind of what you've been doing all day at work. Mm-hmm. So I think, mm. and and I think I think a lot of people will say that when they start to really pay attention to their body and their mind, they find it work quite difficult at mm-hmm. first because yeah. of conventional work because you sort of all of a sudden think at three o'clock I just don't have any brain power like there's yeah. there's no brain between three and four o'clock and I should be having a nap like yeah. I shouldn't be <laughs> looking at these spreadsheets yeah and so I think there's a lot of connection between those things mm. um, and I think you've got to be prepared that if you're going to sort of take the lid off the comfort around sex is actually going to apply to a lot of other things in your life. Mm, absolutely. And I am also, that up brought something for me with, um, if you are in a relationship with someone and they want to have, there's this mismatch of uh, desire. Mm, so yeah. one person wants to have more sex than the other. Um, what is okay? And when is it all right to say no to that person? And um, having uh, solo sex as an option. Yeah, yeah. so I think it's important to say that that is the reality for most couples mm. and that there are very few couples that actually always want sex at the same time mm-hmm. and the same kind of sex and the same amount of sex. There's just so many variables there yeah. when you start to think about it. It's kind of mad that you ever get on the same page in some way. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a celebration you should be having if you both do feel like you want to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that's completely normal. And I definitely think solo sex is a really good way of feeling like you're not going without. Mm-hmm. Because I think there's this idea that there's this expectation that once you're in a couple, the other person is there to serve your every sexual desire and mm. whim. And it's just not true. Yeah. You know, the way to think about it is that you are honoured that they share that with you. Mm. And if you're lucky, you're going to have some good times with them. <laughs> but equally, they're going to go do some stuff by themselves. And hopefully you are, because that's how you're going to kind of like fill up your own wellspring. That's yeah. kind of the way I see it. Yeah. So I think that's really important. But the other thing you can do is um, talking about having sex when you're not really into it is a really interesting one because obviously we're not getting to the consent issue. If mm-hmm. I'm not really consenting, then should I be doing it? Obviously not. But mm-hmm. you can be not totally in the mood and you can trust that your body is reactive to stimuli. So if somebody starts to kiss you or touch you in a way that you really enjoy, then you probably will get a bit turned on. Mm. And you can give your partner the gift of sex if you feel like, well, I can see they'd really like to be intimate. I could be quite happy doing something else. But 
I'm happy to do this for them now. Mm -hmm. And that's a generous and a safe thing to do mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. As long as you then afterwards don't feel really resentful and think, oh, I need to just get the washing on or, you know, <laughs> I really want to make a good dinner or whatever. Yeah. But I think that giving the gift, I think, is like a really helpful way to think about the times when you're maybe not totally in the mood, but it would be a kind thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you are totally willing to give it. To do that as yeah. well. Yeah. Having a bit of... Um, Oh uh, yeah, generous spirit, exactly. And compassion, exactly. Without pressure, too much pressure to have exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't work if it's a case of every time you go to have sex, that's what you're having to do, mm -hmm. and that's not a healthy situation. Mm -hmm. But if it's like once a month, once every so often, yeah, I think that's you know, I think that's perfect, and I think, but I do think that both partners should do it for each other. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. always the one that's giving the gift, then it's perfectly fine for you to. Maybe invite the other person to do it, and they've, they've probably never heard this expression, so mm. you know you'll, you'll probably, have, probably have to explain it to them. Mm. Um, and also, you don't want them saying, Oh, can you give me a gift right now? <laughs> <laughs> you oh. choose when you give it, is the, is the important okay. factor. Yeah. Excellent, yeah, sovereignty, yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, Nikki, I was wondering if you could describe some ways to foster a deeper connection in sex. How can people do that? So many people come to me and they would like to improve the quality of the sex that they're having by feeling a deeper connection by having it feel more um yeah just more connected yeah okay I think that's something that people always struggle with and there's this presumption that if you've been with somebody a long time you should automatically have a great connection mm -hmm. like on a sexual level but the reality is as you become accustomed to someone's body and you create a sexual choreography between the pair of you then actually sometimes the opposite happens mm -hmm. and you kind of slightly sleepwalk through some of the sex that you have and there can be something of great comfort and a great benefit to be having a kind of like low level kind of sex as in what I mean by that a kind of sex where you're both fully consenting and you want to be in it mm -hmm. but maybe you, neither of you are putting too much effort in and you know you just still get some pleasure out of it and mm -hmm. you have a good time together and I think that's completely fine. Mm -hmm. It's what uh, people call maintenance sex. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't sound very sexy, but mm -hmm. I think that's okay. Okay. Um, but I think if you're in the moment with somebody and you want to feel more connection, then you can definitely try and uh, break up that choreography. So if you, you know your leg always goes somewhere after their hand goes somewhere, don't put your leg in that same position. Mm -hmm. Do something fresh. And if you are with a partner that tends to drift off a bit, maybe they close their eyes, you'll probably get like a jolt of, oh, interest or maybe <laughs> what's going on yeah. from them. And that can be really beneficial in just reminding them, oh, I'm not the same person that does the same things with you all the time. This could go any number of ways. Mm. It's always different, potentially, if we want it to be. Okay. And I think the other thing is eye gazing. So it's really underrated means of fostering a connection with anybody. I think we're living in an age in which you know, mobile phones and devices are taking up so much of our attention and mm. the kind of jobs we have are just so over committed in mm. a way. And getting down to that pure attention for someone else can be really difficult. So eye gazing is a really good way of doing that because we know that scientifically it's one of the best ways to foster a connection with anybody, you know, mm. whether that's kind of socially or sexually. Okay. And also it's what we do in courtship. And um, when scientists get couples to eye gaze, they have a better sexual uh, rapport usually mm. as a result of it it fosters desire okay so that's a really simple thing it doesn't cost you any money it just costs you a bit of effort mm. and I think we could all do some of that tonight <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it's funny because eye gazing with people who are kind of new to each other can feel super intense yeah um holding someone's gaze for longer than the two milliseconds that we usually do can feel quite confronting so yeah. Gently going into eye gazing is good for for new for new couples, but also for people who have been together for a long time. Yeah, you just aren't used to actually looking at the person that you see every day. Exactly. So it can be just so everyone knows. It sounds simple, <laughs> like like we're describing it, but it can be quite challenging for for yeah. new and people who have been together for for quite some time. So. Yeah, I mean it's just like meditation, it's mm -hmm. the same kind of practice that should be it's so easy because you're just sitting there being quiet letting your mind not wander but it's so difficult if you've done it I'm a very bad meditator even though I want to get, <laughs> get better at it so I find that eye gazing easier easier than that but I really understand why it's tricky for people but it is worth it and 
you only need to do a few seconds at a time because mm. you can often be very surprised at how much you've gotten out of the habit of doing it. Yeah. So, you know, five seconds is plenty. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. So if anyone was looking for any kind of crazy <laughs> wild techniques from this, then yeah, they're going to be very basic. <laughs> gonna be very... It's all back to basics. Yeah. yeah. Yay. Um, which means it's achievable, right? <laughs> um, fantastic. So... Um, we were talking a little bit before uh, before we came on also about consent and mm. how it's really related, this this uh, thing of connection and fostering connection and consent. And yeah. also um, what consent really means in maybe different words or in a different way of thinking about it that might feel more understandable for people and just easier for people to practice yeah. um, for themselves and then when they're with someone and mm. just know how to, how to practice, how to articulate, how to to live in um, in a new place that we are with consent boundaries and yeah, yeah if you could talk to that a bit yeah so I think consent's tricky for people because they tend to have a very legal definition in their mind of what that is mm -hmm. and they sort of think it's an act that they agree to do it and then they do it and then everything's fine and it doesn't work like that consent is really about um, deciding you do want to do something and it might have just been brought to your attention a few seconds ago mm -hmm. so it might, might not be a huge pre-plan and then listening to your body and to your mind and to your values and deciding that you do want to go ahead with it mm -hmm. now we all make hundreds of decisions to consent to lots of tiny things every day so we're actually very good at consenting mm -hmm. but what we're not so good at doing is tuning in to the points where we feel and oh, maybe we don't want to consent to that and you know that's a product of again a capitalism of living in a world where we have to just kind of go along with a lot of things during our working day we mm -hmm. get very much into the habit of not listening to what our bodies and our minds want mm -hmm. in connection so i think when you want to think about consent it really is the opposite of connection so when you're fully connected with someone you're both in the moment together and you're going on that journey together and if you're not consenting then you're divided from them you're, you're at the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. so i think what's really important is that if you're in an intimate moment with someone and they are giving you non-verbal cues that they are not willing mm -hmm. in that moment so either like their eyes are completely averted maybe they're completely still frozen um maybe they're looking off into space and giving you no indication that they're enjoying what's happening to them or that they're a participant in it if you get to that stage and that person's not consenting anymore mm -hmm. and they may they may not be aware of it themselves that's why it's so tricky mm -hmm. but if you ever have a person kind of freeze out on you you need to check in with them mm -hmm. so what words would you use or what might you ask them in order to check in i think the best thing you can say to anyone and this is a phrase that you can use for so many things when you're having sex with somebody is just how is this feeling for you how are you doing how is this going for you mm -hmm. how are you feeling mm -hmm. How are you feeling is better because like, how are you doing can sound a bit intrusive if you think somebody's really unhappy and they're not just going to say, I'm, and they're not going to immediately come out with, I'm not good, I'm not doing well. Yeah. But how is this feeling for you is useful because if somebody just says fine, like very off the cuff, probably not fine. Mm -hmm. You want to ask a few more questions and yeah. you want to say curious, you want to say calm, uh, you don't want to get angry or upset with them. Mm. Be curious about what is happening for them in that moment. Yeah. And if you keep that in your mind, if that's the mentality you have, then you're going to go there with understanding and care, mm. and you're probably going to get a good answer, mm. or the real answer, yeah. anyway. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That, how is this feeling is a great yeah. question. And not taking it personally. So really not taking it not personally. in a good space, yeah. and just not having that be any reflection on you, yeah. um, because you don't know what's going on with them. You don't. And they may not feel exactly. safe or ready to share with you everything. Completely. I think anybody that's ever had any kind of sexual or emotional trauma, they will have pain points which they don't necessarily know are coming when mm -hmm. they're in a kind of dynamic with you. So they'll have a memory of something that makes them really unhappy or maybe something that somebody did that was not pleasant. And they could just have a flashback, for example. I. It might not be the act that they did that time that's triggering it. It could just be a brush of an arm somehow and for some reason the brain brings up a memory of mm -hmm. the thing that they didn't enjoy. Yeah. And then they have a freeze or they have a, you know, they feel their body retracting. Yeah. So it's important to, to do this asking because, like I said, they might, might not be that conscious themselves of what's going on. But mm -hmm. if you ask the question, they're going to have to all the check in with themselves as mm -hmm. well as with you. Mm -hmm. And the same thing um, I think you were mentioning before is uh, also for yourself when yeah. you have perhaps consented or 
um, had drawn uh, a line and said, okay, we'll do this, this, and this, and I'm happy with that. Or maybe you've said it to yourself. Yeah. And then um, all of a sudden you're in a situation where things that you had thought were going to be okay all of a sudden aren't anymore feeling okay. And you may not understand why. Um, However, all of a sudden your body is telling you, yeah. So how can someone, once they, I guess, uh, how can someone realize once that they've crossed their own line, yeah. their drawn boundaries, how can they understand, actually, I said yes, but I'm not feeling okay about this anymore. How can I now um, communicate to this person that actually it's not, I'm not okay anymore? Yeah, that's a really good one. And it happens to all of us at some point, especially when it's with somebody new and maybe they've slightly misread something that we said that we were with and then maybe we're not so cool with it or they've gone a bit too far or something mm. or touched it in a way that just doesn't feel right for whatever reason mm-hmm. um i think again it, the being gentle is good but you need to be firmer for yourself in this situation mm-hmm. when you're on this side of the dynamic and i think you can just say something like hey could we take a minute always important like always easy to say yeah um just buy yourself some time if you feel like you don't have to to tell a lie but if you feel like going to the bathroom would help you to get a bit of space and to think about what just went on for me where do I want to go next with this Mm -hmm. as in am I finished now like I don't want to do any more today or do I just need to kind of sit or do I just need to get out of that position like whatever it is yeah so I think it's always worth you know if you feel if you're a kind of person that doesn't like to um embarrass the other person that's what you're thinking you're not going to by the way but if in your mind you sort of think or I need a bit of a kind of easy exit. Just say that you need to go to the bathroom for the moment. Gather mm-hmm. your thoughts. But when you come in, it's better to be real about what's been going on. Yeah. So you want to say something like, hey, I'm, ha- I'm having a great time with you, if you are, not if you're not. <laughs> I'm having a great time with you, but I wasn't so comfortable with what we were just doing. Could we, you know, regroup? Could we do something else instead? Mm. Like, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Or, and if you... If you think that saying, can we do something else, might be a bit freezing for them, mm-hmm. then suggest something that you would rather do. Mm. Could we do X instead? Yeah. yeah. Or could, and if that's difficult, if the words are difficult, then you could take somebody's hand and put somebody's hand on your body where it feels good to be touched. Mm. So that can be a way of kind of re-engaging them in a way that's, you know, you're not telling them that they're the problem, you're just saying that thing that you're doing is not so great. Mm. And then helping them navigate exactly. to something that feels good for you. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. 